I'm Tony Ruiz, contributing editor at Gold Derby here with Chris Bowers, who is back uh, in the Bridgerton world uh, with the new prequel series, Queen Charlotte, a Bridgerton story, which uh, is coming soon to Netflix. And and Chris, you know, one of the things that, was, that struck me as I watched these episodes is that, yes, it is very, you know, just in terms of the score, it is still Bridgerton, but I feel like that there is something, there's a different flavor to this. There's a different, and I couldn't quite put my finger on what it was. There's almost like a more of a kind of a classical quality in it. I don't know what it was. Did, did, when you're when you approach this, did you specifically go out of your way to want to make it sound different? Yeah, I'm really glad to hear that you felt a slight difference because that was kind of the intention. You know, for me, I responded to even just seeing the difference in how they decided to shoot it. Like it looks different than Bridgerton in terms of like the tone and it feels a bit more, um, uh, you know, even like color wise, like the, the color design is a bit different. And so tonally, I wanted the score to feel a bit more grounded and not as like um, uh, opulent as, as I feel like Bridgerton is. And the instrumentation um, was intentionally much smaller in moments where we are with the young Charlotte. And then when we go to, you know, the present day, Queen Charlotte that we know from Bridgerton, the palette is a little closer to the Bridgerton sound. So because we're spending so much time with young Charlotte, it has a little bit of a different sound to it. Um, and even instrumentation wise, you know, there's much more um, uh, solo cello and like different things like that. And then also I used a, um, a forte piano instead of a, a regular grand piano for all of the young Charlotte moments to kind of differentiate, differentiate that sound as well. Yeah, and that's and it's so interesting because one of the things that I noticed almost immediately um, is is that this this is a very different Charlotte than the one that we come to know um, in Bridgerton. So um, and so it's almost like connecting the dots. Is, is is that part of the process you go through? Is like how do I connect this Charlotte to the Charlotte we know just from a musical standpoint? Yeah, 100%, especially looking at moments where we see a spark of the Charlotte that we know in this young Charlotte, you know, like from the very beginning, the cue that we're introduced to her with, with her theme has this kind of like muscular, like um, uh, edginess to it that we don't really hear as often until she continues to assert herself and like feel more confident and comfortable doing that. And I feel like that definitely connects to the Charlotte that we know and, and you know, the kind of um, uh, energy that she carries as the queen, um, but also uh, having that regal kind of sound, I think in the earlier parts of the show, it's a little bit more rough around the edges. And as we get to uh, the Queen Charlotte that we know, it feels a bit more grand and, and you know, for lack of a better term, royal. <laughs> well, and, and but also there is also this sense of 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 her as an outsider. Um, you know, because she, you know, comes from Germany because, you know, she's not uh, a natural part of this world, as everybody keeps pointing out to her the entire time. Yeah. Um, so uh, in in devising, do you do you kind of compose around a theme for a character? Yeah, so there's uh, a theme for her by herself, and then there's a theme for her and George, and then there's a theme for George, but I feel like her theme is by far the most prevalent and um, reiterated theme throughout the series. Yeah. And, and, and talk to me about the George aspect, because, you know, anybody who studies, who knows history, who knows that these are actual people, that these are, you know, that the story of Charlotte and, and King George is, you know, has been told in many different forms uh, on stage and in previous feature films. Um, you know, George being kind of known as the mad King, um, does that, it, it, I'm almost wondering, do you do you lean into that madness in the music for him or would that almost be too obvious? Yeah, I think the, the thing that I really love about the show is how much they humanize what he was going through. So we don't think of him as just, you know, a quote unquote crazy or mad person. It's more so, you know, trying to understand uh, it, this particular depiction of mental health. And so I think that, one, it starts with how they shaped the series and that you don't really learn about that uh, or we learn about that with Charlotte. So I feel like 
our introduction to him uh, is through musically is through their theme together. And so we don't hear anything that musically has to do specifically with George's world until we see his episode and, you know, towards the end of the episode before that. And we uh, find out this, this secret that he's keeping from Charlotte and then kind of going into his episode, but it really has more to do with internalizing what uh, writing music that can help us internalize what he's feeling and, and creating this visceral reaction to what's happening. You know, like when you see his episode, seeing his um, hands start to shake and these tremors that he has or this like building anxiety and like um, claustrophobia that is coming from within and like all these different things. I feel like the music is trying to capture that. And so anything that becomes more uh, wild or uh, connected to these moments where he's maybe on the outside seen as crazy um, musically I'm focusing on what's internally happening for him so that we're not observing what what he's doing and how crazy that is but we're more so feeling uh, like we can understand and empathize with with how he's um, getting to this mental state. And I, one of the other things that I particularly love, you know, the casting in this show is just is just spot on. Particularly connecting the older characters to the to the younger versions of themselves, and I think that's especially true for the Lady Danbury character, who yeah. is a great character on her own in 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 Bridgerton. But we kind of see this 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 genesis of of the Lady Danbury that we know. And so was that kind of a, a a fun challenge to go, okay, this is a character that we think we know, but we really are fleshing it out here, how she got here. Yeah, totally. I think that that was also another theme uh, and like sound world that was really fun to play with and develop and thinking about, especially how we see her interacting with Lord Danbury, you know, for, for the time that we do. And I feel like, um, uh, we musically see her as like a bit more sly and like, you know, um, um, trying to find a way to uh, methodically maneuver in, in the situation that she's in. And then over the course of the series, we obviously see more as to um, how she becomes the Lady Danbury that we know in Bridgerton. And I feel like similarly, her sound also develops over the course of the season so that it goes from, um, you know, this like, again, kind of sly uh, approach to something that just feels a bit more uh, weighty and and um, uh, serious. Yeah, and and at the same time, you've also got, you know, the this kind of new dynamic with Brimsby and 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 Reynolds, yeah. you know, which I can't wait for viewers to see what that what that is like. But, you know, it's a kind of a new thing that we're seeing in in Bridgerton at this at this level. Was that was that something that that created a new kind of exciting opportunity for you? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I remember that was one where musically I I kind of similar to Bridgerton, like listened to a, a few different like pop tracks just for fun in terms of like how to reference their theme, especially the first time we see what happens with with um uh, Brimsley and, and Reynolds, and I feel like it just has a bit of um it gives Brimsley just like a different edge than you, you think he has, you know, in, in Bridgerton and, and uh, even in, you know, from Charlotte's perspective, what she knows of him. And so I think that it was really fun to play with this other side to him and, and the other side to this world um, in the show. You know, one of the things when we first started, you know, talking about Bridgerton, I remember, you know, especially even during the height of the pandemic, it had, it changed the way that you, you know, were, creating music and, you know, you know, creating these kind of lush orchestra sounds with very few musicians. I remember, I believe we talked about like, you know, having a single musician play multiple parts to create that kind of sound. Now that we're a little bit removed from it, are you still kind of using the same technique? Yeah, we are. I mean, I think that, you know, it's something where Shondaland really fell in love with the sound of the score so much that they didn't want to change anything, you know? And so um, it's a bit of that. And also for, it's funny because for Queen Charlotte, I knew that we were going to record in that way. And I also knew that I wanted to have a smaller, more intimate palette for uh, the young Charlotte moments. And I thought that it would be easier since we're already recording people separately, they wouldn't have to do that much layering. But then the, once I started writing, I started to like write 
instead of it being like a string quartet or string quintet, it was, you know, like an octet or like, you know, 12 pieces essentially. So now the cellist, instead of playing the same part and layering that same part, like we do for Bridgerton, it's this cellist playing like four different parts that are all going to be like mixed together. So I had a lot of fun with the malleability of, of our process and being able to record people individually and, and write these really intricate parts that overlap and all of that. But it also, I'm sure was much more stressful and difficult for all of the amazing musicians that were recording at home because they weren't just playing the same part over and over again. It was, it was much more uh, intricate. Yeah. And, and of course it wouldn't be uh, um, anything in the Bridgerton universe without, without the covers, without the, you know, the great string quartet covers. Um, and I'm not going to say what songs are here. Uh, I like people to discover that, but just in terms of, you know, the conversations that you and uh, Alex Batsavas have, um, how involved are you in those decisions? Or and, or do you just sit back and say, and Alex brings you something and you go, okay, here we go. Yeah, I mean, I'd say like most of that is Alex, you know, I mean, or almost all of it is Alex and, and her choosing those, those pieces and those covers and those recordings. And, you know, for this show in particular, we explored the idea of creating some very specific songs for the show and ended up with a couple of pieces um you know one in particular in episode one that features a, a vocalist actually which we don't, don't use vocals very often and um that was really conceived with you know a different type of approach and looking actually at joseph bologna chevalier de saint george as as a reference you know him as a black composer in this time period and alex and i talked a lot about how can we uh you know look at the other great black artists in that time period that you know maybe people aren't aware of or weren't aware of that you know maybe charlotte might have known in our imagined uh world that we're creating and so chevalier was a, definitely a huge influence for that track uh, in episode one and and then some of his actual music appears later in the series um so yeah we worked together a lot on on some nice specific moments but all, all all those covers are definitely still alex being you know the the legend that she is but uh, there's one in particular and i'm not going to say which one but it's it had such a different sound to me and it worked perfectly mm -hmm. um and i'll tell you off camera what it, what it was but in terms of you know the orchestrations of those how how much do you try to stay the song but still do something new with it yeah well you know i'm curious to know which one you're referring to because most of the ones that are in there if not all of them are actually ones that were already recorded and arranged oh, so, really? yeah so I, I didn't do i didn't do those so i think um yeah you know whenever i'm doing it, it there's definitely a strong attempt to um have things feel like they are really intimately referencing the original track both mm -hmm. like parts and you know background vocals and all that kind of stuff but um but yeah i don't i don't think there's anything that that i did in there um just out of curiosity uh you know you, you're kind of kind of synonymous you know music wise with the world of bridgerton and and you keep coming back to it i mean is there what keeps you kind of engaged in this world and finding new and exciting things to do one i think it always comes down to the collaborators and the fact that you know, they all are not only so clear on on the characters and the stories that they're telling and, and all of that, but also give me so much autonomy and freedom in how I want to explore that musically. Like, I think that it's been so amazing to have the trust that I do from Betsy and Tom and, and Shonda and, um, you know, anyone else that's, that's heavily involved and even Alex. And I feel like as uh, an artist, it's really amazing to have that type of collaborative environment, but also just for me with the show, it's really just um, uh, like, I love when you show the complexity of, of uh, you know, the human psyche. And I feel like they do such a great job with that. Not only in Bridgerton, especially for me, like with season one, I think it was just so amazing to see, uh, like I said, when we were working on that show um, to demonstrate to a couple choosing to stay together and choosing to work through the difficulties of of a relationship and love. And I feel like love stories focus on the will they, won't they usually. And for that one, it was much more about 
how do I learn about this other person's triggers and traumas and still figure out how to accept them and love them through that? And that's so powerful. And I think similarly with Queen Charlotte, there's so much that the two of them are learning to cope with in this relationship. And for me, I feel like, you know, I, I feel like I grew up in an era where love stories didn't really touch on that aspect of love. And I feel like being married and and also being a, a child of like a long marriage it's really amazing and, and uh, reassuring to see a show highlight the the not so pretty part of it and and still show people working through that, not necessarily giving up when something gets really difficult. Um, and so, yeah, I feel like that's something that I really appreciate about the shows is just as a fan. And, and so to be able to write music to help us feel the the ups and downs of those dynamics is uh, is a uh, joy for sure yeah and i think this this show is an exciting new uh chapter to that um uh chris always wonderful to uh to talk to you um everybody go to goldderby.com make your predictions for the upcoming emmys and stay tuned for interviews with more contenders throughout the season chris browers uh queen charlotte will uh be premiering soon on netflix and uh we'll talk more offline <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, always always a pleasure to talk with you thank you <laughs>